Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Federalist Files. We're going to be going over Federalist number 76 today. It is titled The Appointing Power of the Executive, written by Alexander Hamilton, April 1st, 1788. Topics include Defense of Presidential Power to Nominate and, S and Senate to Appoint Public Officials, Party Politics and the Appointment Process, and the President is a Formidable Vessel uh, for Nomination. So this one generally, this this paper goes over the nomination of uh, Supreme Court justices, min public ministers, consuls, ambassadors, and then there's a little bit of a mention that the president can appoint to Senate. I think it's actually Congress. Uh, let me see here. But the president may vest the law. You know what? We'll get to it. Oh no, he, he'll fill up all vacancies which happen during the recess of Senate. So he actually cannot do that. It is the vacancies in those positions at the recess of Senate. If Senate's not there to approve, he'll just fill the vacancy temporarily to the very end of the next Senate uh, meeting. Okay, so he starts the paper off. He defends the provision that entitles the president uh, to, and I quote, to nominate and by and with the advice and consent of Senate to appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointment are not otherwise provided for in the Constitution, end quote. Yeah, so there's uh, his own cabinet as well. Those are people that have to go through. Actually, his own cabinet, I don't think he needs to go through the Senate. I'm not 100% sure of that. But I know all the consuls, all the ambassadors, all of that needs to go through the Senate. Anything that's not provided for in the Constitution, which I'm pretty sure... Uh, Actually, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of secretaries of state and stuff like that. I think they have to. Go, they do have to go through the Senate. So his cabinet does somewhat have to go through the Senate as well. Uh, but yeah, okay. So next, he's going to state, and I quote: "But the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, or in the courts of law." or in the heads of departments, the president shall have power to fill up all vacancies which may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session, end quote. So yeah, that's that's what I was uh, referring to before. He can fill all these vacancies if the Senate is not in session, uh, which makes sense because you need to have continuity in the process. process and then when the Senate comes back in, it, it pretty much them being in that position will expire because the Senate's going to have to uh, either they're going to have to approve that person or maybe the president nominated somebody else that then they'll go for the approval. So this doesn't really give uh, this gives a temporary power to the president of appointing the, some of these uh, officials. So it goes on to state next and I quote. It will be agreed on all hands that the power of appointment in ordinary cases ought to be modified in one of three ways. It ought either to be vested in a single man or in a select assembly of a moderate number or in a single man with the concurrence of such an assembly. The exercise of it by the people at large will be readily admitted to be impracticable as waiving every other consideration. It will leave them little time to do anything else. End quote. So yes, there's either three ways to do this. You can do it through just the executive. You can do it through an assembly of people or you can do the executive nominates. And then the the appointment, the approval of the Senate uh, passes this person and appoints them to the position. And that's the way that they obviously chose was the, the very last way. Just because it's unreasonable. And, and that's the reason why um, he says at the very end, the people at large can do it. But really it's unreasonable, it's impracticable. If every single time a minister or a public official was up for, um, you know, nomination or appointment if we had to go and vote for that every single time you would find probably i'd probably say 95 percent of americans would not vote at all so it would be kind of controlled by a minority of americans that are willing to like if i had to do it i don't even know if i would go up there and vote every single time if i had to go to show up to a poll every single time a minister or or a consul i mean it'd be different for a supreme court justice but just these really small minute positions in the government if I had to vote on every single one of them. And also, I mean, how would I have to read the background of every single person and figure out who it is that I'm voting for? That's why it's just it's just considered unreasonable. 
So next, Hamilton, he asserts that the power to nominate and sometimes appoint should stay in the hands of the president rather than the people at large because it is impracticable to draw citizens away from their private lives so frequently, like I said before. So he goes on to state, and I quote, The sole and undivided responsibility of one man will naturally beget a livelier sense of duty and a more exact regard to reputation. He will, on this account, feel himself under stronger obligations and more interested to investigate with care the qualities requisite to the stations to be filled, and to prefer with impartiality the persons who may have the fairest pretensions to them. End quote. Yeah, so he's saying, if you really think about what the president was supposed to be, uh, our very first president, you had George Washington. He was in, he was the only independent ever to be the president. There wasn't as much party politics instilled in the presidential position as there was in the legislative branch and the way in which the legislative branch was to be viewed by the framers in the constitutional uh debates where they you know they created the constitution and that's really what the, the problem is is if this was something that was to be you know of the legislative power it would be highly politicized and that's what he really was worried about in this case and he was saying, you're going to have the president, he's kind of somewhat to an extent um, independent, he's going to look through it deeply, and in him being independent also shows that he is dependent, because he's one, per he's one person in that position, so if he nominates a bad person, or the wrong candidate, then you're going to get a backlash from the public, and they all know who to point to and who to blame, whereas if it's an assembly of people, you can blame multiple people, so it's kind of harder to... Uh, it's harder to point out and single out that one person to blame for it. And that, in essence, actually provides security and it provides accountability of the president. So, he goes on next to state, and I quote, He will have fewer personal attachments to gratify than a body of men who may each be supposed to have an equal number and will be so much the less liable to be misled by the sentiments or fr of friendship and affection, end quote. Yeah, so he's just saying, you're going to have the legislative authority. They're going to be highly political. If you think about it today, they are highly political on everything that they really do. So you're going to have somebody that's kind of displaced from that whole system. And they're not going to have these crazy personal attachments to party uh, like the legislative branch does. So he goes on next to state, and I quote, A single well-directed man by a single understanding cannot be distracted and warped by that di diversity of views feelings, and interests, which frequently distract and warp the resolutions of a collective body. There is nothing so apt to agitate the passions of mankind as personal considerations, whether they relate to ourselves or to others who are to be the objects of our choice of preference or preference. Hence, in every exercise of the power of appointing to offices by an assembly of men, we must expect to see a full display of all the private and party likings and dislikes, partialities and antipathies, attachments and animosities which are felt by those who compose the assembly. So yes, he they were worried of, of party politics kind of diving into these positions that aren't supposed to be political or partisan. And, and, and he's absolutely right about that. Um, and then he goes on to state some, like, really drop some knowledge in a couple of these next quotes. Uh, so next, he, he cites that when the power of appointment will be given to a body of men, and he, and he states, and I quote, The choice which may at any time happen to be made under such circumstances will, of course, be the result either of a victory gained by one party over the other, or of a compromise between the parties. In either case, the intrinsic merit of the candidate will be too often out of sight, end quote. So he's saying, yeah, they, they go for party politics, they go for political wins, and no one actually looks at the intrinsic uh, merit of the person if the person is the one that's qualified for doing the job. And we see this very often in politics. Um, I mean, if you just look at Sotomayor, Sotomayor, uh, Kagan, the two of them in the Supreme Court, I think Sotomayor is an idiot. She's only there because she's a partisan, really. There's this go, and they're supposed to be kind of independent. Um, and when I mean idiot, she she legitimately cannot do the job. Like she is a moron. She can she cannot speak. She she's an idiot. There's no reason for her to be in that position. Um, so this is very often the government. Jen Psaki is not really that great of a press secretary either. She's not that fluent as well. 
I mean, you can think about, about a lot of positions. There's a lot of people that if you, I'm trying to put this in a family friendly way. If you brown nose enough, you can get into a position. It may not be an extremely powerful position, but you can definitely get into some sort of government position uh, with power that you can use to leverage to enrich yourself. So next he goes on to state, and I quote, In the first, the qualifications best adapted to uniting the suffrages of the party will be more considered than those which fit the person for the station. In the last, the coalition will commonly turn up turn upon some interested equivalent give us the man we wish for this office and you shall have the one you wish for that office this will be the usual condition of the bargain and it will rarely happen that the advancement of the public service will be the primary object object either of party victories or of party negotiations end quote so this is a profound statement that he makes because it resonates to today, uh, it is applicable in modern times. Give us that, and we'll give you this. Give us that. It's always, and right now, I think they're, they're talking about getting this infrastructure bill done. It's it's another $2 trillion, I think, of spending. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, they're just going to keep printing. they are just continue to print money, and, and everyone doesn't realize it, but it, they're pretty much just taxing everybody this entire time, and no one's going to realize it until it's too late. Everybody's going to realize it a year ahead of time or two years ahead of time. All of the, the mass amount of printing that they're doing, they're talking about bipartisan infrastructure. I saw the picture of of Romney. but <laughs> What's the other one's name? The other one that hated Trump so much. Cheney. We, we, see, we see, oh, it's a bipartisan bill, and then you look at who the sponsors are on the Republican side, you're like, they're not, okay, so it's a Democrat bill, really? I mean, I don't understand. But yeah, so so this is this is how it goes. It's kind of that quid pro quo kind of deal. So Hamilton in this paper and many others portends of these uh, partisan politics that is intrinsic in the modern-day political apparatus. Hamilton explains that these negotiations will be that of uniting the suffrages of parties and bargaining, give give us this man for the position we will give you this for the other as in you know a quid pro quo kind of deal it's a dirty deal for sure it doesn't and at the very end when he says it will rarely happen that the advancement advancement of the public service will be the primary object either of party victories or of party negotiations yeah so so all this that they're doing all this the semantics quid pro quo kind of deal it will, it's not for the advancement of the public service. Therefore, it's not for us. It's not to help us. It's not conducive or beneficial to the people of America. This is all party garbage, really, essentially is what he's saying. Give the power of nomination to the executive magistrate, <clears throat> giving the power of the nomination of the executive to the executive magistrate avoids several disadvantages of having the absolute power of appointment in the hands of one man. Uh, Hamilton employs that it will be impossible to avoid the party animosities in the appointment process. That being said, even though the nomination will not always be appointed, every man who might be appointed would in fact be the choice of the president. So so this is kind of the the balancing act that we do now is we can't give all those powers in the hands of one man. We have the executive just to nominate, but then the appointment, you still need the approval of the Senate, which I'm pretty sure it's like you need a majority of the Senate for approval. Uh, yeah, it's a majority of the Senate for approval, and that, in essence, gives some sort of a sa- safety and a safeguard, and also, it's still the choice of who the president wants to be in there. Most of the time, the Senate isn't going to vote against them, unless if they have some crazy charges, or they're like a communist, which we've actually seen recently with that one woman. I, I can't remember her name right now, but she didn't get appointed because she's like a self-proclaimed commie. So next, he states, and I quote, in the act of, of nomination, his judgment alone would be exercised, and as it would be his sole duty to point out the man who, with the approbation of the Senate, should fill an office, his responsibility would be as complete as if he were to make the final appointment. There can, in this view, be no difference between nominating and appointing. The same motives which would influence a proper discharge of his duty in one case would exist in the other, and as no man could be appointed, but on his previous nomination, every man who might be appointed be, in fact, his choice, end quote. So this is the important part is <clears throat> the executive really solely has the discretion of nominating exactly who it is that's in that position, in that public minister position, you know, in the Supreme Court p- position, whatever. 
they have that discretion to choose who's to be nominated for the position. But the Senate may actually disapprove of it. But still, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, and the president puts a new person up there, it is always the president's choice of who that person is. The Senate can either confirm or deny that. So Hamilton claims, the personal, and I quote, the person ultimately appointed must be the object of his preference, though perhaps not in the first degree, end quote. So yes, it, it no matter what, it still you know, installs this system where the president is still the person, the primary person choosing who it is, and then the Senate is kind of the safeguard to make give them the yay or the nay, really. So Hamilton adds that vesting the Senate in the responsibility of appointment is a check on the favoritism of the uh, president. Hamilton assures that the spirit of favoritism would only serve as an embarrassment if employed by the executive magistrate. So he states next, and I quote, the Senate could not be tempted by the preference they might feel to another to reject the one proposed because they could not assure themselves that the person they might wish would be brought forward by a second or by any subsequent nomination. They could not even be certain that a future nomination would present a, candle, a candidate in any degree more acceptable to them. And as their dissent might cast a kind of stigma upon the individual rejected and might have the appearance of a reflection upon the judgment of the chief magistrate, it is not likely that their sanction would often be refused where there were not special and strong reasons for the refusal, end quote. So yeah, most of the time, chief magistrate comes out, nominates this person. Most of the time, they are going to be confirmed by the Senate. The only time they're not going to be confirmed by the Senate is if there's some sort of special and strong reason for the uh, refusal. Maybe they're a treasoner. Maybe they're a communist. That would be a... Um, a viable reason for the rejection and more importantly is the senate really is in no power to refuse for no reason because there's no guarantee that the next person that gets nominated by the president is going to be someone that's you know uh that's any, any better for the position for them they're not going to nominate if the senate let's say you know brett kavanaugh they got brett kavanaugh out who would trump have, have brought up next with brett rather than have brett kavanaugh probably would have just been amy Con coney barrett so it's not like it would have really helped the Senate in any way. Um, yeah, so, so next these states, and I quote, I answer that the necessity of their concurrence would have a powerful, though in general, a silent operation. It would be an excellent check upon a spirit of favoritism in the president and would tend greatly to prevent the appointment of unfit characters from state prejudice, from family connection, from personal attachment, or from a view to pop popularity. In addition to this, it would be an efficacious uh, source of stability in the administration. End quote. So yeah, this just kind of guarantees that there's there's not going to be some sort of a prejudice or family connection in the appointment of these positions. I mean, we saw Trump had a little bit of nepotism in his office. He had his, I think it's like uh, you know, uh, Ivanka was was in his staff as well as her husband, his son-in-law. Uh, Jared Kushner, and they kind of pushed a lot of Democrat policies, a lot of liberal policies, which which I'm not a fan of um, myself. But you know, everyone said it's because Trump had to had to find people he can trust. I, I get it to an extent that he had to find people that he could trust. But I mean, if you look at Mike Pompeo, Mike Pompeo was somebody he could trust. Mike Pence was somebody he can trust. I mean, he could find people to put in those positions. It's just that maybe he wasn't a, that good of a judge of character, just from. You know, from what we saw, people were in and out of there. Steve Bannon was another one that was in and out. Uh, you know, Christie never really got in there, Chris Christie. And I think part of the reason was because Jared Kushner's father got locked up by uh, Chris Christie. And I think that's the reason, really, why Chris Christie never saw a position in there. Not a huge fan of him either. So, I mean, there's just uh, politicians in general sense. It's like, you're just not a really a big fan of any of them. You know that you can't live and die by them because they will betray your trust very quickly. So next he goes on to state, and I quote, It will be readily comprehended that a man who had himself the sole disposition of offices would be governed much more by his private inclinations and interests than when he was bound to submit the propriety of his choice to discussion and determination of a different and independent body, and that body and entire branch of the legislature, the probability of rejection would be a strong motive to care in proposing, end quote. So yeah, just pretty much making sure that this person isn't going to go by their own private inclinations, uh, that they're going to make not the, not make this their personal interests, 
and have this this independent body which really isn't that independent of a body um <laughs> the legislative branch well i guess they are independent if you really look at it the the independence of the executive branch to work as a safeguard and a check against the executive in that case so next he states and i quote this supposition of universal finality in human nature is little less an error in political reasoning than the supposition of universal universal rectitude. The institution of delegated power implies that there is a portion of virtue and honor among mankind which may be a reasonable foundation of confidence and experience justifies the theory. End quote. When he says experience justifies the theory, he kind of goes on to explain the House of Commons in Great Britain. Uh, saying that they were kind of corrupt, corrupted. Uh, when he, when he's talking about universal finality, he's saying to have this specific provision in the Constitution isn't because we're saying that there's a universal finality. And when he says finality, he means like corruption. There's there's wrongdoing going on that's universal and an inherent in nature. He's, he's saying that is not the case. The real case is that we want to instill a supposition of universal. Uh, rectitude, which is like another word they use at the time for integrity. We want to, you know, push integrity and have all the safeguards in place in the case of, in case of something bad happening like this, then there will always be a safeguard. There will always be a uh, safety net in the government. So Hamilton ensures that the power of nomination in the hands of the president is safe to the liberty of citizens because the president doesn't have the power or cogency to corrupt the senators, they are de- they are derived directly from the people and will provide stability in the system. So yeah, he this this is the whole part of it being independent uh, branch of the government that the president really can't do anything to take them out from their positions. There, there's nothing the president can do. So he states next, and I quote in this very last quote. He states, "The Constitution has provided some important guards against the danger of executive influence upon the legislative body. It declares that, and I'm quoting, no senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the United States which shall have been created or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time, and no person." holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office, end quote. So yeah, just, just essentially, uh, the president can't do anything. They can't appoint any senators. They can't appoint any representatives, anyone of the Congress to any other position in the United States government. They can't increase their pay. They can't do anything. So they're completely independent, um, of the presidential authority of the executive authority. So that really concludes this one. Next is going to be Federalist number 77. That's actually going to continue on this and some other of other powers of the executive as well. And then right after that comes Federalist number 78. And that's where it starts with the Supreme Court. Those are personally like my favorite papers. I think 78 and 79 are really good ones. Um, yeah, but we'll get to that. Check out the current events. Check out the uh, weekend specials. I greatly appreciate it. And I will see you guys all next time. Thank you.